My name is Mitch Belkin, and I'm here with my brother, Daniel Belkin. Our father wanted us to introduce the podcast to everyone by saying who we are. So that's who we are. We're radiology residents in Baltimore. And today we are here with Dr. Joanne Elmore, who is a distinguished professor of medicine at UCLA. She's an established investigator in the fields of epidemiology and cancer research with over 200 publications on topics which include diagnostic accuracy, cancer screening, physician variability, and AI machine learning. So Joanne, welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. Thank you. Your father can be very proud of you too. <laughs> Before we get started, do you have any financial disclosures? Yes. Uh, I serve as an editor-in-chief for the adult primary care topics at UpToDate, and I'm funded by NIH to study topics such as AI and mammography. Well, you've done research on a lot of different topics, including physician variability and pathology. So just sort of how do you think about all of these different interests that you've explored? How do you put them together and kind of summarize them for someone who's not familiar with you and your uh, various intellectual interests? For the topic of breast cancer screening, it reminds me a bit of a Rorschach inkblot test in that there is such a large accumulated mass of scientific evidence, but everyone's looking at it and coming up with different interpretations. And there's the evidence-based, there's the cultural issues, there's the financial issues, um, and there's societal and political issues. And specifically with respect to mammography, you've, you've been writing about this subject for quite some time. Was there anything in particular that got you interested in mammography and doing research in that topic specifically? Yes, actually. Uh, I'm an internist. I see patients still, even though I do research. And I uh, was in clinic one day at Yale, New Haven Hospital, and clinic got done earlier. And so I thought, let me go up to the breast imaging area and see if they could teach me how to interpret mammograms. And I went up and the head of breast imaging was there. And I asked her, you know, can you show me how to interpret these? And she pulled up a mammogram of a patient I had just seen and said, there's a focal asymmetric density here. And she looked at me and said, what did the biopsy show? And I had to tell her that I had just seen that patient in clinic, had told the patient the mammogram was normal because the initial reading on that mammogram was normal. And when I started to get a little bit nervous and asked this professor, you know, why are you calling this abnormal and thinking it should get a biopsy? I still to this day remember her reaction. She said, oh, this happens all the time. And she then showed it to a third radiologist who gave a third diagnosis. And I thought, I have to study this. And so uh, I then um, quantified variability. When you take one mammogram and show it to 10 different radiologists, you can get a lot, a lot of different interpretations. It, it's visual data. We have methods and standards, but it's still visual information that the humans are processing. You guys know this because you're both going into radiology. <laughs> I guess this is a good point to just sort of take a step back and talk about what is mammography? What's the difference between screening mammography and diagnostic mammography? And what are some other modalities that people use in order to figure out if someone has breast cancer? Everyone knows what a chest x-ray is. I think most people know what a mammogram is. They're recommended for screening because they can. it's thought they can detect early lesions before they get serious, where we still have the chance and the opportunity to provide life-saving treatment and with less disfigurement. And so that's a screening test. That's very different from a diagnostic test. If a woman comes to me in clinic and she's already felt a lump in her breast, I order a diagnostic mammogram where they sometimes get additional images, magnification views, et cetera. And to explain what a mammogram feels like for women getting them, people have seen pictures. They compress the breast tissue. They want to reduce the motion artifact. They want to reduce the amount of radiation that the women get. But they hurt <laughs> when you get them. They're brief. They're very quick to obtain. Just take seconds. So that's a screening mammogram. You asked about the other types of screening. Many will remember when women were told to do their own breast self-exams and I still remember women would come to my clinic and I'd ask them, are you performing your own breast self-exam? And the women would look guilty because they weren't. And 
women were told you should do it once a month when you're in the shower, you would buy a pair of nylons and on the front of it, it would tell you how to perform your own breast self exam. Um, they have done studies, a big, large randomized clinical trial in China, problematic studies, but they basically found that there was no benefit and that when you have women do regular breast self exams, they find a lot of lumps and bumps and then they come in and they get a lot of false positive diagnostic evaluations. So it hasn't really been adequately studied. I still think it's helpful for women to know the general contour of their breast because surprisingly, a lot of breast cancer still is detected by women, not by screening. Um, a lot of women come in saying, you know, I had a normal mammogram, but I've got a lump. So that's breast self-exam. The other potential way that has been studied for screening for breast cancer is the clinician's breast exam. You know, you guys were taught in med school how to do a breast exam. There was a very large clinical study where they compared a high quality breast exam with mammography. And surprisingly, the high quality breast exam did almost as good as mammography. But there was one challenge in that this was really high quality in that these exams were performed by specially trained clinicians and they were careful, thorough exams. They would spend up to five minutes per breast palpating carefully. Now, we've been talking only for, what, two or three minutes. Can you imagine this entire time you would be palpating a woman's right breast? It's just not done, that high quality of an exam for screening in the U.S. No longer are there recommendations that clinicians do regular annual screening breast exams. A lot of clinicians still do them just to keep up our skills, to sort of do education of the patient while you're performing the exam, but it's no longer recommended. In terms of things that are recommended, one thing that I remember from medical school was the guidelines for screening, which depending on which organization you asked, you would get a, a totally different answer. Do you start at 50? Do you start at 40? Do you start at 45? Back in May of this year, the USPSTF issued a new draft recommendation which changed breast cancer screening. It lowered the age at which women should be screened from 50 to 40. Do you know why this decision was made to change the screening? No, I don't know why. And I am looking forward to the final official recommendations. I trust and value the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. They are evidence-based. They are thoughtful. They are very careful to make certain that the members of the committee are unbiased, don't have a financial incentive to recommend for or against something. In reading their over 200-page early draft of the, the evidence, I noticed that they mentioned that there's a 2% per year increase in the incidence of breast cancer. I know that over the years, technology is improving in radiology. We've gone from film to digital, and now we've got beautiful 3D TOMO mammograms. And so as the technology has improved, hopefully the false positive rate has gone down. So I suspect they took that into consideration. And then they also mentioned the racial inequities and differences. And I have to commend them for taking the whole picture into consideration in that Black women, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, it is often a more aggressive type and they have a 40% increased risk of dying compared to whites. And that's just not appropriate. It's We need to do something about that. And Blacks are often diagnosed at a younger age with these aggressive tumors. And so I don't know all the you know, statistical modeling to make this recommendation. I did see them say that if you start at 40 every other year, it might reduce by you know 19% the number of lives saved. So it sounds like they have done some statistical modeling, but there haven't been new randomized clinical trials. You can't do a new randomized clinical trial. It's just not ethical at this point. Not ethical because mammography has proven that it reduces overall survival at this point based on studies from the 70s and the 90s. Yeah. And you you wouldn't want to randomize women to no mammography. Can you talk a little bit about some of those trials? It's my understanding looking at them that some of the earlier trials showed 
a benefit, especially in the 70s up until the 90s. But some of the later trials, especially, really stopped showing, although there might be some disease specific benefit where fewer people die of breast cancer, the overall survival was basically the same between the two groups. And I think that that makes me at least a little bit skeptical about the recent possible change because you know it's great that they're trying to catch more more cancers earlier and it's unfair that black women have a greater disease burden when it comes to breast cancer than white women but it doesn't necessarily follow that if you start the screenings earlier that you're actually going to benefit that group and in fact if you're subjecting that group to more medicalization more more biopsies more complications from the biopsies and things like that you might actually be causing more harm in that group Breast cancer screening is one of the best studied screening tools that we have. Over 600,000 women have been involved and have volunteered to participate in these trials. Most of them not in the U.S., (laughs) most of them with like film mammograms. And by the way, for your audience, you know, film mammograms, these are really old that you put them up on those light boxes that you flip the switch to turn the light on behind, you know, so things have changed remarkably. There really hasn't been a lot of new data. Some of the data that was used by the task force is from this Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium that is a population based in the US and they have been gathering data on women. They link it in with the tumor registries and they have been able to provide data that has been helpful. And a lot of it is on interval cancers, ones that you wish you could have caught. They also have gathered data on the false positive rate. Much of the existing older data is just one round of screening. And there's something important about cancer screening and a lot of what we do in in healthcare. A lot of the data is just one screen and then they say, oh, do it every year for life. There's cumulative benefits and risks that need to be considered. And they have gathered a lot of good data now to compare What happens if you get a screening mammogram every year versus every other year? And that was very helpful in that there's a lot of differences in the callback rate when a woman goes and gets a mammogram. In the U.S., we call back 10 to 12 percent. In Sweden and other countries, it's it's much lower. It's two to three percent. And they have the same accuracy in regards to cancer detection. So, you know, we in the U.S. need to reduce our callback and our false positive rate, but yet we don't want to miss the cancers. And given some new information, the task force was able to take into consideration the fact that if you screen every two years, the false positive rate is halved, you know, it goes down by 50%, and you still pretty much detect almost as many cancers. So you have to weigh the potential benefits with the potential harms, and you alluded to them. So if you want to talk about potential harms, we can. (laughs) Yeah, let's let's talk about them. Well, number one, it hurts when you get them. It's transient. Number two, you're getting radiation exposure. And, you know, radiation itself can cause cancers. Then there's false negatives and false positives. A false negative is when you get a screening mammogram, you get the letter that says everything's fine, come back in a year or two, and then you feel a lump. And you may be falsely reassured by that normal screening mammogram. There are just some breast cancers you truly can't see on mammography. And so, you know, there are some false negatives. False positives are much more common than people thought. This was one of my earlier studies where we followed women over a decade of annual screening. And do you guys want to guess how many women had a false positive after just 10 years. And remember, we're recommending if women start in the 40s, they would go into the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, maybe even part of the 70s. So just after 10 years, you guys probably know this, what percentage of women would have been called back with a false positive, being told, don't worry, but you might have breast cancer, you need more testing. 50 to 70%. Exactly. It is quite high. When these early studies were done, I think it surprised people. They didn't have the concept of the life course. And you need to take that into consideration because screening is something that is done on a healthy population and we're supposed to first do no harm. So false positives, 
They are anxiety provoking. Women do not react well when they get a letter that says, dear Mrs. Smith, don't worry, but you might have breast cancer. Please come in for more testing. And they call me as their primary care internist. Um, and I try to help get them in sooner so that they can have the evaluation quickly. You know, most of these are easily evaluated with an ultrasound or an additional diagnostic imaging, but they're they're very anxiety provoking and very costly. And in fact, I get frustrated when women are offered a free screening mammogram, but then they have an abnormality and who's going to pay for the evaluation of that? That's just not fair. There are certain inequities that we still have to fix in our country. Then let's see other potential harms, overdiagnosis. We didn't even know what overdiagnosis was when I was in medical school. And now we realize that, you know, we're, we're diagnosing a lot of cancers and they've done studies of, for example, women who die in a car accident in their forties and the pathologist will do fine cuts through the breast. And these are women that thought they were healthy. They're finding breast cancer in these women. Now, they find the same with prostate. There's a lot of cancer that people have that probably will have for their whole lifetime. Maybe it would go into remission and never cause harm, and they will die of cardiac disease or something else. The, the randomized clinical trials, we thought that we would see a reduction in mortality because you're catching the breast cancers early, but instead we just kept diagnosing more and more and more, especially these pre-invasive lesions, the ductal carcinoma in situ. And the DCIS cases, women, understandably, when they get that diagnosis, and we can't tell them whether they will or won't be the person that will go on to have subsequent breast cancer, a lot of them choose a mastectomy. You know, they don't want that psychological anxiety weighing on them. So those are some of the potential harms of mammography screening. And remember, we're taking healthy people. There's one other comment I should make about the benefits. When you hear people talk about the studies, they talk about a 19% reduction or a 30% reduction. That's a relative risk. Whereas the absolute benefit doesn't sound so good <laughs> in that if you're screening a thousand women every year, you get 10,000 mammograms of those thousand women, you might save one woman's life. Whereas 500 of those women will be called back for additional testing. So the absolute number of women that will benefit is much smaller. That's still important. And we want to do everything we can to save lives, but it's sadly much smaller than I, I wished it was. I'm curious with the recall rates being so different from the US as compared to many of our European, I guess they're not really neighbors, our uh, European colleagues. Do you have any sense as to why the US callback rate is so high? Is it just the general litigiousness of America? Are there certain rules or regulations as to what percentage of women you need to call back? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Multifactorial. I think that we've got cultural norms in the US that we, we really don't want to miss things. I think our training, probably as you go through your own residency training, we don't want to miss things. And some of it is the malpractice fear. I've done studies of radiologists. They, they definitely fear being sued. And one of the biggest malpractice reasons, the allegations in the U.S. is failure to detect cancer. And breast cancer is a real big one. But it is shocking how different it is. A 10 to 12% callback rate is pretty high compared to 2 to 5% in some European countries. Now, there's other differences in the, some of the countries. They do double reading where each exam is read by two people. And if you have a second person that's going to check, I think that would lead at least me as a physician to be a little bit more reassured and perhaps more comfortable not calling back those borderline cases. In the US, every mammogram is just read by a single radiologist, usually. I guess that's a good segue to inter-rater reliability. You've done some work on mammography reads by radiologists and pathologists. And I guess my first question is, who's more reliable? <laughs> but more seriously, like, how good is it if you give it to two different radiologists or two different pathologists? Like, how likely are they to say, this is X? Good question. One of my early studies was a design where I had, you know, 100 mammograms, showed them to 10 different radiologists. 
And there was a lot of variability. You know, one case I would have a few say, get a biopsy and others say it's totally normal, have her come back in a year or two. And this is radiologists who are in regular practice, not students. This is radiologists who interpreted mammograms as part of their their career and their, their work. And they were reading them independently. They weren't told somebody else is worried about this. There is documented variability between physicians. And I have to say that there is also documented intra-observer variability in that we took the same mammograms and nine months later showed them to those same radiologists. We kind of reorganized them. We didn't tell them they were seeing the same exams. They didn't always agree with themselves. You know, it just shows you that the field you're going into, it is a very challenging field. For those that like art, you know, art is in the eye of the beholder. Is there a focal asymmetric density? Uh, You know, can you pick up those calcifications? It's really challenging. So for years, I studied variability of radiologists in the interpretation of mammograms. I looked at how characteristics of the patient might affect it. You know, for example, whether the woman is on hormone therapy, which might alter the breast tissue to alter the accuracy. I looked at characteristics of the radiologist that were afraid of malpractice, might have a higher recall rate. Interestingly, those that had recently finished their residency training, they had a higher callback rate for a few years. There are differences in level of experience of the radiologist that can explain some of this. But after many, many years of studying radiologists and their variability, I realized that my gold standard outcome, do they have breast cancer? Yes or no, might also have variability in that if you think about it, the pathologist, they get a chunk of tissue, they look at it under a microscope, that's visual data. And I had never really thought of this until I had a skin biopsy and I was told I had melanoma. So I got a second opinion, was told it was fine. Then I got a third opinion and said, no, it's a Spitz lesion. So I had three diagnoses from a pathologist on one biopsy, you know, and I was fine. It ended up not being melanoma, you know, 15 years later. But that caused me to then say, I want to pivot and study pathologists <laughs> because they're the end doctor, the end diagnosis. And so I have shown that for a diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ, there's a lot of variability among pathologists. And I've also studied pathologist variability in skin biopsies, melanocytic lesions, and it's even worse, you know, less than 50% agreement on melanoma in situ and thin melanoma. I have a question about breast density. Uh, I know that we were talking, I think, before we started recording about breast cancer density laws and sort of the Mammography Standards Act. Could you tell us what these laws are? And I have another question, but we'll start with that one. (laughs) Well, let's explain what breast density is. Breast density is totally normal. It's normal tissue. It's just that some women have fatty breasts, some have more dense breasts, And we categorize them A, B, C, D, and C and D are when it's a little bit more dense. And half the women have dense breasts, you know, 47% of women in the U.S. Dense tissue is more common in younger women. And the reason why it's relevant is that when you have dense breast tissue, it makes it really hard for the radiologist to find things. And so the accuracy is lower. In addition, when you have dense breast tissue, your risk for breast cancer goes up. Not a lot, but it goes up. You know, for example, it's similar to if you have a relative with breast cancer. So because of that drop in accuracy and because of that increase in risk, there were some very involved patient advocacy groups started in Connecticut. One woman really uh, was a leader on this uh, and, and, you know, they they pushed at a state level to have density laws so that it is mandated that women are to be told about their density. They're to be, to be told that they have dense tissue. And in some states, they are to be told that they should get additional supplemental imaging. Now, I'm a big advocate of communicating with patients and educating patients, they deserve to know this. But jumping to telling women they should get supplemental additional testing if they have dense tissue, there's not an evidence base to support that. I wish there was. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says that there's insufficient data, and they urged 
more research and more funding to study this in that what is currently happening is a lot of these women, they find out they have dense tissue and then they're told we'll get an ultrasound and ultrasound screening. In fact, you said you were interested in ultrasound screening. You know, it's very operator dependent, a lot of false positives, false negatives, and we, we don't have enough ultrasonographers probably to do screening on millions and millions of women every year, uh, especially if half of the female population getting screening has dense tissue. In addition, it's that highest density category D that's the one that, that puts you at really the highest risk of drop in accuracy and, and increased risk. But yet this is affecting half of the women in the US. And it's now part of the updated Mammography Quality Standards Act in that as of, I think it's next year, every place in the U.S. is going to have to inform women that they have dense tissue. Communicating with patients, we have to be really careful in the wording used and the framing and make it educational and not alarming. Um, And so uh, I I do worry about um, patients misreading or or getting more anxious by this. I was looking over a table of the uh, density and prevalence by age. So younger women say 40 to 44 seems like about 57, 60% have either heterogeneously dense or extremely dense, the two highest categories. Whereas if you look at women that are 65 to 70 in that category, it's about half that. It's about 30, 32% are in the denser two categories. What's interesting about that with respect to the screening programs is Having denser breasts is an independent risk factor for having cancer, but the biggest risk factor for having cancer is age. And so yeah. if we move the, the with the USPSDF recommendations, moving from 50 to 40, the age of screening, we're going to be catching women when their breasts tend to be denser, which is a risk factor, of course, for having cancer. But in a population that on average is less likely to have cancer as compared to an older population, I guess I'm curious if you expect that this would just lead to more recall rates? The answer is yes. You described it perfectly in that once the federal mandate is in play, and right now the majority of states already recommend this and already mandate it, although there's variation in the language that is used between states. And studies have been done, uh, you know, women are confused by the wording. You are correct in that with the new U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines, we're waiting to see what the final recommendation is. But if they now start recommending beginning at age 40, that is the majority of women that have dense breast tissue. So a lot of women will be told that they have dense tissue. They'll be told you're at increased risk. But I don't think they'll be explained what does that mean? You know, majority of them will have category C which means, you know, that's the same as if you have an aunt that had breast cancer in her 80s. They won't have that additional coaching and information. Hearing that you're at increased risk for breast cancer, that is enough to make a woman anxious. So earlier in this interview, you mentioned that it's not ethical at this point to do another randomized control trial with screening mammography. And I'm curious, is that what other people are saying or if that's what you believe? My understanding is that current meta-analyses basically show that there isn't a benefit in all-cause mortality. You might be preventing some breast cancer deaths, but the early trials to the later trials don't really show a benefit in all-cause mortality. You're trading one death for another, in other words. And I think that many people believe that that's large attributable to treatment, that as treatment has gotten better and better, it becomes less essential to catch it earlier and earlier. So I'm curious if you believe at this point that we should really reassess the state of medical knowledge, because these things get crystallized as guidelines. Here are the guidelines at one point of time based on certain data, but at a later point in time, the data have changed and those earlier data are maybe less relevant. Now it's so good to be treated for breast cancer. Does it make sense? that we should be screening people as much as we currently are, given that there are all these potential issues with it? Well, first of all, you've made a good point, which is we're reducing breast cancer mortality. We're not finding a reduction in mortality in general. That's really important. And that's a fine point that most people don't understand. I 
always value (laughs) more evidence, but I'm also practical in that it wouldn't be feasible or reasonable in the U.S. to do a randomized clinical trial now of mammography screening in the 40s. And it would take 10 years, probably take a year to get it going, and then 10 years of studying. And just think about what could happen during those couple of years into it. You'll have AI that will start interpreting, or you'll have a new improved image quality that will totally change things. And so how to study your field of radiology which you develop the gold standard randomized clinical trial that takes a decade, but you've got so many things that are changing. And you you did bring up the fact that treatment has, oh, it's remarkably improved. We now have what millions of women alive in the US with breast cancer. You know, many have been saved by treatment. Many have also been overdiagnosed, but we can't tell who's been overdiagnosed and who isn't. So it definitely is something that I would love to see more data. And I don't like statistical modeling (laughs) because there's so many what ifs, you know, you give me enough data and I could, you know, wag the tail on an elephant, but who knows? I'm not certain that the data really substantiates it. And so the answer is yes, I would love to see more data, but I don't see another RCT coming. You brought up artificial intelligence. Are you bullish or bearish on AI advances, not only in the radiology realm, but also pathology too? Neither. I feel like more of an owl observing it. Years ago, we had computer-aided detection programs and mammograms. They were very simple algorithms that were sold in the US and they would put marks and arrows to show the radiologist, look here, there may be something suspicious for cancer. I got an idea to study these computer-aided detection models years ago. One of my clinic patients asked me why she had to pay extra money for it. And I thought it was a good question. And I was working at that time with the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. And so we looked at data at a facility level of quite a few facilities that used the computer-aided detection And we looked at their level of accuracy compared to facilities that weren't using the computer tool. And we found something that surprised us in that when computers were added, the accuracy was lower. Now, this made sense to me as a physician who's been studying diagnostic accuracy and how we doctors make decisions. And I hypothesized two things happened. One is radiologists don't want to miss anything. We care. They care. And if they see an arrow, every exam had like three to four arrows. So the false positive rate went up because they didn't want to miss anything. But perhaps they became a little bit falsely reassured that the computer had their back and they started missing things that they might have observed if they hadn't been relying on a computer. So we published this year years ago. And uh, I thought we were going to put the brakes on it. And this was a learning curve for me. You know, you publish something New England Journal of Medicine, you think people will listen. No, it just continued to be used until almost 100% of mammograms in the US use these computer tools. Finally, follow-up studies proved that accuracy was not improved with the use of this computer tool. And Medicare decided that they were no longer going to pay for it. And so you know, how to get around that. Now it's kind of folded in when you buy the machines. So this is a background story as to why I have concerns about AI. I think that we need help. We have both inter and intra observer variability, and the computer will at least be reproducible. (laughs) I do trust that the computer algorithms that I'm working on with different companies, that they truly will be wonderful support tools. But I'm intrigued by how we physicians then will react and use the tools because there's a lot of work being done in the development of the machine models, but more thought needs to go into the human interaction. And some of these are already FDA approved. I I know at different institutions, they're already going to start using the AI tools. Maybe there'll be a marketing tool to say each of your mammograms is going to have a a computer-aided detection, you know, artificial intelligence to help support the radiologist. So in our country, we have, we love technology. I call it technophilia. So I can see this propagating and being used. And I'm just worried, given my prior experience studying computers use, 
as a tool that it didn't always work out the way you had hoped. So an analogy when it comes to catching cancers and screening programs that Paul Offit uses a lot is the barnyard analogy. I'm sure, I don't know if he came up with it. I'm sure I've heard it used in other places. It's probably a pretty common thing, but basically you have the different types of cancers. You have your birds, your rabbits, and your tortoises. And the goal of a cancer screening program is to catch as many rabbits as you can, because if you can close the door, you can actually prevent the rabbit from getting out. But catching more birds there's no point because the cancer is growing so fast, it's going to kill you no matter what. Catching a cancer that's already going to kill you earlier doesn't really do any give you any benefit. And catching a turtle just opens you up for all sorts of overdiagnosis, medical overuse, and other complications from the screening program. You know, I'm obviously very hopeful about AI, and it's going to be, I think, very integrated into the field of radiology in the near future. But I don't hear a lot of people talking about the fact that we might just be catching way more birds and tortoises rather than hares. And it would be great to see some more randomized control data on using these tools, even if they improve physician accuracy and inter-rater reliability, which I think would be very important and, and very useful. If we're catching more of those other things compared to rabbits, we're not actually providing benefit. Maybe it's better to just let the humans do it. I hope that AI will help us in radiology, but also in pathology. And I'm hoping AI can help us identify things in the biopsy that might also be important to predict your analogy, the bird, the rabbit, the tortoise. Basically, is this going to be a bad thing that's going to harm my patient? Is it going to metastasize? Is it going to return quickly? And in regards to the outcomes We haven't really spent much time talking about interval cancers, but I think these are more clinically significant in that you can gather data on sensitivity, specificity, the stage at the time of diagnosis, because you don't want to diagnose a whole bunch of ductal carcinoma in situ that everybody lives, you know, nine years. It's not really harming that many women. You don't want to miss cancers, though, that a few months later the woman will have. And so learning how to detect the interval cancers, that to me is a better marker and will be less likely to evolve into more overdiagnosis. And some of the AI tools, they're doing things that don't just look at this mammogram, but they also look at the prior mammograms to, and they can pick up on changes over time. All right. Well, we're running out of time. It's unfortunate. We have so many other questions for you. We wanted to ask you about open notes. You do so many interesting things. I guess one last question before we close. What is one medical truth that very few of your colleagues agree with you on? When we say somebody has a cold, they think we have a correct diagnosis. I would say that much of medicine, we have oversold our diagnostic capabilities. And this is one reason I love the art of medicine because every patient is different. Patients think we uh, are able to specifically diagnose and classify them very quickly. And it's usually an educated guess. On that note, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. If people are interested in learning more about you and your work, where should they find you on the internet? UCLA. I'm a faculty member there. All right. Well, that's it. You heard it here, audience. You just go to UCLA and you'll find Dr. Joanne Elmore. (laughs) <laughs> Joanne, thank you so much for joining us. No, my pleasure. really was. And I wish you guys the best of luck as you go into radiology. And I like your evidence-based and how you are critical of the literature. It's something that is important. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends.